Does anyone need a book? Does anyone need a book? A book? We got them. we still got a few folks coming in. Good morning. Good morning. We've still got a few folks coming in. That's a hint. Here they come. the high price of fuel, people are driving slower, and it takes them longer to get here. So I anticipate more tardiness for some people. Good morning, Bobby. Good morning. Well, as always, it's really great to see you folks again, and something I look forward to. And uh, Charles and I kind of swap back and forth. But at any rate, uh, hey, there's Joel. You're back. All right. Good to see you. Aren't you teaching this morning? Oh, here. Yeah. Oh, here. So I thought. See. All right. Good. The lesson this morning is lesson four uh, in the second part of our study from Isaiah. It should be in your book on page 31. And as reading through this, it almost appears uh, uh, repetitive or deja vu because it seems like we keep talking about this subject of idols. And people will say, well, we don't have a problem with idols today. I mean, we don't worship statues and build rock monuments and bow down to them like these folks did. But in thinking about that, uh, try something a little bit different this morning. I would like for you to turn over to uh, the page 38, which is the last page of this lesson, and look at the first application. And if perhaps if we understand where we're trying to go, then when we go back and look at the lesson, maybe it'll make more sense, hopefully. But anyway, on page 38 of your book under application, it says the futility of idolatry is on full display in Isaiah 44. This is what we'll be studying this morning. Although few individuals today bow down to a statue of their own creation, many idolize sports, money, popularity, pleasure, power, and such things. Anything we place ahead of God in our lives is an idol. Instead of replacing physical idols with mental ones, let's exalt God and His Son Jesus above all else. So actually, when we think about our cases today, we're thinking more about mental idolatry rather than perhaps an actual physical structure. Now, uh, I was trying to look for some idol around my house to bring in as an example. I don't bow down to them. But in our travels, uh, one of the places we went uh, have more than once is the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Some people may think of Cancun area. And raise your hand if you've ever been to Cancun. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so at any rate, when you go there, one of the uh, uh, popular uh, trips that they try to get you to take is a, a day trip over to a place called Chichen Itza, which is a big temple structure that was built I don't know, sometime between, I guess, four and 600 A.D., not really sure, when the Mayan culture was the predominant culture of that area going all the way from Central America all the way up to Mexico. So you, you had the uh, Mayan culture there that was very large, and, and now it's overgrown with jungle, and they're still discovering areas that are covered with jungle of these uh, cities that existed in the, in the Yucatan Peninsula. Well, 
they had all these stone figures that represented their gods or things that they prayed to, and they'd build these tall pyramid-like temples, and they'd go, the priests would go up there, and they would offer human sacrifices, and uh, they would do all kind of uh, terrible things to appease their, their God uh, through this system of idolatry, not knowing anything about uh, Jesus Christ and the Lord uh, at that time. What God is going to do with those people, I'm glad God will take care of that. I'm not worried about it. I'm worried about us and me right today, where you and I are, are going to end up going. So with this idolatry, they sell a lot of little souvenirs made out of different kind of stone uh, or emblematic of these different gods, like Quetzalcoatl and others, all kinds. You know, I can't think of all of them now. But at any rate, when we think about those type of idols, it's perhaps the type of idols we're talking about in today's lesson in Isaiah 44, beginning with verse 6. If you don't have a book, we have plenty of books, but our lesson today, but any, under, under your introduction, introduction there, the title of the lesson is Idols or Worthless. And we'll go into a little bit more later, but when we think about when something is worthless in our mind, how would you define worthless? Well, you can say, well, that's simple, but how would you define worthless? Don't look at me. I mean, <laughs> I'm not talking about husbands and that sort of thing. But how would you define something that's worthless? No value. Okay. Okay, I got that one down there. No value. Anything else? Huh? Useless. Useless? Yes, that's another one. Useless? No benefit. Excellent point. And we'll get to that. No benefit. And so I, I wrote down just a few uh, one words here to define it. Useless. No profit, uh, no value. And so these are the type of things that we think about when we think about something that is worthless. Even though these peoples thought, uh, they tend to think in a moment. Uh, do you and I ever think about something in a moment? That we do something, uh, we go somewhere, we buy something, we do something uh, in a moment or perhaps at the last minute. And these folks, thinking about that God had delivered them from, uh, from the Egypt, and it had been a pillar to them that they could actually physically see, fed them, uh, their shoes didn't wear out, they had food to eat even though the variety wasn't very good and they didn't like that. But it wasn't very long that we remember that Moses went in, uh, up to the mountain to, to uh, appear uh, before God in a sense uh, to receive the commandments that we refer to as the Ten Commandments. Uh, and amazing, it says in your lesson here that you'll notice that in the Ten Commandments, it warns that you shall have no other gods before me. And that's, of course, from Exodus uh, chapter 20, where you read the Ten Commandments. That was the first one. You can't have any other gods. I'm it. There are no other gods. And then he went on. Secondly, it says, and builds upon the first. And he says, I forbid both the creation of idols and the worship of them. So there was this uh, thing in people that wanted to build and make idols. So I think today, you know, I guess one of the big religions uh, in uh, maybe Southeast Asia and, and Asia is Buddha. Have you ever seen that idol, Buddha? I'm not going to demonstrate it because I know I'm a little bit big here in the middle, but it's got a big old belly that sits there. And that's their god. There was, a, I guess, an individual, Buddha, and this, uh, the big statue, and there's a lot of people who look toward Buddha as their god, this inanimate object made out, I guess, metal and stone, et cetera, and they would worship this. And, of course, that's not the only one. Uh, there are other, a lot of idols. Remember when the Apostle Paul uh, went to Athens there in, uh, I think it was Acts 17, and uh, he looked at all those temples and big buildings, and he said, I perceive that you are a very religious people. That's a great sermon, by the way. Paul, I mean, you talk about using psychology. Rather than going into that city and saying, man, you people are crazy. I mean, these, these aren't, this is not God, this is idolatry. But he says, I perceive that you're a religious people because they had a temple or, or a statue representing everything they could think of. You know, Mars, Zeus, all, all the uh, uh, gods that they could come up, worshiping the, the moon, the stars, and everything, everything else that you can think of. And they had one temple there, you remember, one building that says to the unknown God because they wanted to cover all the bases. And so it's the unknown God that Paul was there to talk to them about. 
I'm here to tell you about this unknown God. And then he started at that point and preached that, you know, that, that fantastic sermon about Jesus Christ and uh, going forward. And so I don't know what it is in people that want them to have gods. Then I think about it, we condemn those people for bowing down to something made out of wood or stone or metal or a combination of it and say, well, you know, that's just stupid. But yet you and I, we have gods. I don't, I don't like to admit it, but all of us have this, is it propensity? Uh, uh, we, have, we have this uh, idea that we had to have something that we're seeking after to give us some kind of fulfillment. If I have this thing, if I obtain this thing, where it's social standing, financial standing, uh, academic standing, then I will be fulfilled, I will be a complete person, and I will be happy as a result. So maybe a lot of it is just the pursuit of happiness. And we tend to look for that in all the wrong places when it's right before us. Right before us. The scripture, believe it or not, has all the answers for happiness and fulfillment. It has the answer to hope and the hope that lies within us. I mean, think about a world without the existence of God or His Son Jesus and what He did for us. What kind of hope would you and I have today? Well, we could hope to be live well, live in a nice place, nice area, have plenty of food, plenty of clothes, plenty of money, plenty of everything else we can think of. And we hope to get all we can of that before we pass away and somehow we will be fulfilled. And so we think about some of these uh, fabulously wealthy people. Are they really happy? I don't know. By the way they live, you have to think, not really. A lot of them have spent their time to try to make you and I miserable, you know, or society, to influence society, to make other people, you know, miserable, and they get pleasure out of that. But at any rate, thinking about idolatry, this is what we're really talking about in Isaiah 44. And I know we have talked about idolatry. As a matter of fact, the last time I think I was up here, we were talking about idolatry. And I said, man, this is deja vu. We've already talked about idolatry. But Isaiah is full of it. I mean, it's just over and over. It is a major problem. To think about these folks were God's chosen people, his chosen nation. If there's a reason really to give up on somebody, if we read the history of the people here in Israel and Judah, it would be them. You know, we think, oh, man, we, I'm just ready to give up on them people. But thankfully, God made a promise to Abraham, and he was going to fulfill that promise. He said, all people would be blessed through you, Abraham. But he also says, you know, this land where you are, I'm going to give it to all your descendants. And sure enough, when we think about the northern, southern kingdom, Israel, Judah, they occupy this land. I bring it up because I, read, I saw a thing on uh, some kind of YouTube thing saying that there's going to be a big, big battle in Palestine, in Israel. There's going to be a huge physical battle. Uh, and it's coming, you know, it's going to be an apocalypse type thing. And there's people who still push and preach, and it's even tied in to politics for some powerful people that someday there's going to be this big battle in, in Palestine, Israel, and, and that will be the reign in, the beginning of, of the thousand year reign of Christ on earth. And there's people, I mean, they're putting stuff on there, here's the signs of the end of times. Here's things that are occurring that's telling us that we're getting close to the end. And there are a lot of people buying into that. We're getting, you can think of that because what's going on in the world with the wars and the economics and all that stuff, that we're getting close to the end. But let me tell you, folks, if you are a student of history, it's been bad, really bad in the past. Go back to the first century. Go back to the Roman Empire. Go back to the Greeks, the Persians, the Babylonians that we can talk about. All these things appear to be apocalyptic or coming into the time. That's a lot of preaching. And you're thinking, well, that's not in our lesson today. But, you know, in thinking about what do we really need to talk about this morning, uh, these are some of the thoughts that I have. Any comments up to this point here on page 31? Uh, talking about what happened here. You remember in Exodus 32 that uh, the people asked Aaron to make them, an, uh, make them a god, small g, and he did. I don't know why Aaron did that. That was really a dumb move on his part, but I think he caved in. Moses had been gone, and they were thinking, you know, Moses, he's not coming back. I mean, he is gone, gone. What are we going to do? 
well, we better make us some idols to bail us out of the situation because we're out here in no man's land and we need a God. And I know all of us seem to be very visual, right? I mean, seeing is, is something that we, we see something, we like something, and we don't like it or whatever. But people somehow want something they can see, touch, and feel. Even though we've already mentioned it's, it's worthless, I mean, it can't do anything. And we'll read here uh, in a few moments in the scripture about uh, what happens when people make these idols. Comments. Yeah, he said, I didn't, you know, it's just bingo, right? I mean, I didn't have anything to do with it. I just tossed all these, uh, all your jewelry and earrings and bracelets. Huh? But that's what they wanted. He said, I'll give them what they want, but I tell you what, it costs a lot of tragedy, a lot of death. And any time we disobey God, that's a result. I'm glad that uh, God doesn't uh, destroy us in a moment like he did often back then. I don't think I'd be here. Yes, ma'am. I don't know about you, but I think most of us pray for some individual in our lives that God will continue to give them time to make some change in their life, to uh, turn back to God, uh, to accept Him and begin to worship God and obey God, and ultimately be saved. And, and, and we, we pray that God will give people time. And uh, in, in Second Peter, where he says that God is long-suffering, not willing to any a perish. Now he's, he's not saying everybody's going to be saved. Some people might look at it that way. But he gives us time, not willing anyone perish or be lost. God doesn't want any of us to be, to be lost. Does that mean that no one's going to be lost? Well, as I say, go back and read uh, Matthew chapter 7. Um, and it's a narrow way. Uh, and many people are going to take the broad way. And so it's, uh, it's something to, um, to really think about. And we can d condemn these people for these idols. But you know what? From what I read in the introduction, we have our idols also. And, uh, and it's, it's difficult because it gets between us and God. Anything that gets between us and God, can, is that considered an idol? If it keeps us from studying, from worshiping, uh, is that an idol? Would that be a definition of an idol today? Okay, uh, let's see. Where were we here? So... In reading our, our scripture today um, and talking about useless and, and worthless, uh, and we think, well, this is a thing of the past, but you remember there in your book there, it says, 1 John 5, 21, it says, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And this is the very last verse in 1 John chapter 5. And yes, you say, well, why would he warn people to keep themselves from idols? Because it was still a problem. Now, this is hundreds of years after Isaiah. 2,000 years ago for you and I, it was a problem in Isaiah's time. It was a problem in the first century. And it's still a problem. That it gets between us and God. You know, uh, it also says there in 1 John chapter 5 that Satan, you know, this is his world. It's his world. We think, you know... It's God's world in a sense He created everything. But who's ruling on earth uh, today in, in a lot of people's lives? And most people, it's Satan. He uses all these different cunning and tricks to divert our minds away from God. And so, fortunately, because God made this promise to Abraham that through his seed, all men would be, not just Jews, but all men would be blessed. That means you and I. It means Gentiles as well as Jews would be blessed. And sure enough, eventually Jesus Christ would come on the scene and we'd all would be blessed. A lot of what we read in Isaiah is going to be very prophetic, messianic, dealing with the coming of Jesus Christ. And we'll 
as you get a little further along here in Isaiah, we'll have some really obvious, more obvious scriptures talking about Christ. There's references there along, but uh, that's what's going to happen. Uh, let's go to Isaiah 44 and verse 6 through 11 and look at some of our texts. Isaiah 44, beginning with verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, capital R, and the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. You remember any place in the New Testament where you read that statement? I'm the first and the last. I'm the, or you can say, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Rather than using the expression first and last, I don't know anything much about Greek, but doesn't Alpha mean the beginning, Omega, at the, I am the beginning, I'm the end. I am the beginning, and I am the end, and I always was. Now, our human minds can't wrap ourselves around that, and I think that leads to some people's disbelief. I mean, just, where did God come from? If God created us, where did God come from? Well, you can sit, sit by yourself sometimes somewhere and contemplate that, and I think you just kind of keep going around in circles. Our minds just can't answer that question. And a lot of people can't accept that, that if there's not exact scientific proof by whatever means, scientific uh, method, they call it, if I can't prove it and see it, hear it, taste it, then it doesn't exist. And that's where a lot of folks from here come from. But it says, I am the first and I am the last. You'll see that also twice in Revelation, but at the end there in Revelation 22 and 13, you'll see that statement that I am the beginning and the end. Besides me, there is no God, no other God, period. And who can proclaim as I do, then let them declare it and set it in order for me. You know, prove it, okay, prove it. Since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, things that happen, and things that are going to happen, and Isaiah is even going to tell us about some of the things that are going to happen. Let them show these to them. Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. How about you and I today? Now, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. I'm not where I'm coming from. You know, I'm not trying to be smart aleck or anything like that. But are you and I Christ's witnesses? How else is anybody going to know about it if we can't get them to read the Scripture and testify to that? We are Christ and God's witnesses. Is there a God besides me? It's a question. Indeed, there is no other rock. I know no one. That's taken from 1 Samuel 2.2. And so, going forward there, let's read through verse 11. Those who make an image, all of them are useless. Now, we talk about the term useless. And their precious things shall not profit. We talk about unprofitable. They are their own witnesses. They neither, is it, Judy, is this neither, not neither, right? Neither, okay. Neither, neither. <laughs> okay, that's, you anyway. know. Little joke there. Okay. They, not, they neither see nor know that they may be ashamed. Who would form a God or mold an image that profits him nothing? Nothing. Surely all his companions would be ashamed. And the workmen, they are mere men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yet they shall fear, they shall be ashamed together. So he's really calling, isn't it, in God here through Isaiah calling people out? If these idols are such a great thing, they're made by human hands, and so you've got a creation, we're created by God, dictating to God about what we should do and how we should worship. Now think about how ridiculous that is. Now think, it's really ridiculous. And through this, you're trying to get people to think, you know, this is ridiculous. That you think you can go out and make something, an idol, and pray to that thing, and it's going to guide you and answer, uh, take care of your problems. When it's, it's the creation telling the creator what to do. It is ridiculous. I mean, when you think about logic, this logical thinking, it's ridiculous. But yet we do it. And how about you and I? Is it ridiculous to think that by acquiring things here on the planet, and I know we, we all have our goodies and our things we like to collect and like, and, and, but if it be, 
comes between us and God, it's an idol. And we're hoping this idol can answer all our heart's desires, all our hopes, give us all the answers. And it's just not going to happen. How about comments on that section of verses right there? I think it was in a moment thing, as I mentioned before, there when it was waiting for Moses to come back, and he didn't come back in their time schedule, and they said, well, you know, he's gone. Either he got killed up there, uh, or something happened. And so, in a moment, they thought, you know, in a panic, what are we going to do? Well, they saw God and his works delivering them out of Egypt. What were they thinking? These are the same folks. I mean, this was, should have been fresh in their minds. Right? And Israel wanted to be like the people that they were conquered. And it influenced them tremendously because it, had they done what God told them and utterly drive those people out, but they didn't drive everybody out. There were still nations around them that they didn't destroy or totally drive out. What did they end up doing? God told them, don't marry them. What did they end up doing? They ended up marrying these folks and mingling with them and being part of their world. And it influences us. And you and I today, we have the same dangers uh, if you were able to uh, attend, you know, that, the lecture at uh, the, the sermon at North Hampton last Tuesday, you know, either we're going to influence the world or the world is going to influence us. You were there, weren't you? And, and you can't, I mean, there's things we cannot change, but we can't allow those things to change us, you know, and uh, that's, that's difficult, isn't it? exactly what they did. So in a moment, I think they panicked in that Pacific incident. They said, you know, we got to do something. We... Yeah, there's all kind of carrying <laughs> I like that. Carrying on. We, we won't go into detail about carrying on, but there's a lot of stuff going on. You know? <laughs> a lot of, well, I won't go there. But there was a lot of things going on uh, that were evil uh, that, that, that took over. You know, and so, uh, I don't know. It's uh, Judy, I can't answer that question. Because these uh, pagan nations around them, when they went in to take the promised land as part of the promise to Abraham, by the way, the land promise has been fulfilled. One of the things you read on Facebook is, well, the land promise will be fulfilled when we can go to Israel and have a big war and take it over and Christ will return and reign here. Baloney. Because if you studied jo Joshua, it had been completed. And they inherited that land, uh, and, it, and it's laid out specifically what parts of Palestine that they, the different tribes uh, took over. So that was fulfilled, but yet, yet there's people out there saying the land promise has not been fulfilled. They just need to read the Bible. Yeah. 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 I think I finally see your point. Yeah, I'm pretty slow, I know. Slow thing about this stuff. Thank you, Judy. I think you're right. Uh, Gary, answer it. The lesson here for us is you know, when we might defer the moment of decision and we follow the peer pressure and we do the things like that, then when we have time to think about it and consider what we're doing, a lot of times we, we regret what we're doing. We do not do the right thing. Yeah, and thank God we're allowed to repent and change while we have life and breath and because. You know, I, you'd always go back to 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 and 9 that we put up there at the end of our sermon. Is we have, we're going to continue to sin, but if we're in Christ and we have this repentant attitude and we're battling these things, then God's going to be with us. Robert. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. They were looking for some spiritual fulfillment. It seemed like that all mankind has this thing within us that wants us to worship something. I mean, you don't have to. You didn't have to be a Jew or or Israelite to have this desire. It seemed like they always looked up and worshipped something. 
to look beyond, that's what you're saying, beyond that physical thing. Well, sure, there was a statue there that they worshipped, perhaps, some kind of idol, but their thinking went beyond offering some kind of relief from drought or from crops or war or, or infertility, whatever they were, were worshipping about. They were looking for something beyond themselves. And, it, and Robert, I'm glad you brought that up because all of us hopefully are looking for something beyond ourselves that no man's an island, we can't live within ourselves. All of us had to have some type of uh, uh, fulfillment, you know, going forward. You have something to say? I see it. No, okay. All right, very good. This is a uh, participatory class, <laughs> not a lecture. Okay, very good. Okay, so we went on here to see, where were we? Uh, okay, we already talked about that. Uh, Let's look at uh, verses 12 through 17 of chapter 44. This next section. Verses 12 through 17 of Isaiah 44. The blacksmith with the tongs works one in the coals, fashions it with hammers, and works it with the strength of his arms. Even so, he is hungry and his strength fails. After all, you know, this is a creator creating these things. Why should he ever get thirsty or tired? He drinks no water and is faint. Verse 13, the craftsman stretches out his ruler, rule. He marks out one with, with chalk. They used chalk back then. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? Uh, he fashions it with a plane. You know, you're, you're, you're doing it woodwork or a shop. You know what a plane is? You can do it by the hand or they got uh, mechanical ones, right? Right? Planes? I don't know anything about that. You know. I like woodwork, but I'm just not good at it. Okay. Uh, it says that he, he marks it out with a compass. And he makes it like the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, I would pick a woman, that it may remain in the house. So they're making these things, these blacksmiths, but they're seeing this blacksmith who, who forms a thing, he's getting tired, he's getting thirsty, and you know, you see these blacksmiths, you know, they got these big aprons on, they got these big old burly arms, and they're pounding away on that steel. You know, it's not like Gunsmoke, where, where, where Quint is the uh, blacksmith, because... Uh, you know, he looks pretty good, but he, he's, I don't know if he was a blacksmith. Now. He, he looks too good. You know, he looks too pretty to be a blacksmith. Anyway, and it says in verse 14, he cuts down cedar trees for himself and takes the cypress and the oak trees. He secures it for himself among the trees of the forest, and he plants a pine, and the rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn. So he's going to have the same wood that he's going to make an idol out of. He's going to burn it. So uh, uh, some of it, and warm himself. Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread with the same wood. Indeed, he makes a god, small g, and worships it. And it says he makes it a carved image and falls down to it. You know how ridiculous. He burns half of it in a fire with this. He eats meat. He roasts a roast, and it's satisfied. He even warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. Verse 17, And the rest of it he makes into a god. His carved image. He falls down before it and worships it. Prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. Now, Judy, I don't know what makes people want to do stuff like that. While you'd go out in the forest and get this wood and, and carve but throughout all the civilizations of the world, you know, you can go to ancient Indians and they made these totem poles. You can go to Egypt and they had those temples and they worshipped the sun and they worshipped cats and all kind of creatures. Uh, and so it's something within mankind wants us to worship something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Amanda says it's something they can see. Right? Our senses, they can touch it. I guess if it's made out of nice smelling wood, they can smell it. Uh, I mean, this is something, it's visual. It stimulates our, our senses. And so, that's impressive. Where Amanda says, to believe in God, in Jesus Christ, and His Holy Word, it takes faith. Are we saved through faith? Didn't, didn't Paul say there in Romans that, you know, the time has come where, you know, we're going to be saved by faith, not through 
some ritualistic things we do in a temple through a priest system where they go in and worship sacrifices and to, the, uh, to the supreme part of the temple, the Holy of Holies, once a year and offer sacrifices. We are going to believe in God and Jesus, Him crucified. It takes faith. I wasn't there, and no one in here was there. Even though some people believe in reincarnation, I don't, I don't think that, that anyone could say we believe in God because we saw Jesus. We were in the company of the apostles, and therefore we can believe. But what did Jesus say? He said a time was going to come that people don't see these things and are, and are going to obey, and He said they're more blessed. You and I didn't get to see Jesus. We didn't get to see any of the apostles. We didn't get to see any of their first generation descendants. But yet you and I believe, why else would we be here today? I don't know why anyone would be here today, you know, if they don't have at least some belief in God. If you do, you're just wasting their time. As you get older, you realize time gets shorter and shorter. Why would you want to waste your time coming here, studying this book, worshiping, if it's all a bunch of fables. But yet, this is what these people were doing in their idolatry. They were trying to look for something, as Robert says, beyond themselves that would satisfy this inner thing in us that really believes there's something above us, something greater than us, a God, small g, God, big G. Robert. Yes. It is. It is. If you continue to study, yeah, it builds. Yeah, what Robert's saying, for a lot of people, they can't get past that idea of faith. I just, they can't, Joe, you know, they can't accept faith. It just, they just, faith is not something that, that they can see, touch, maybe, grab a hold of, you know, physically. Like Amanda says, there's nothing physical, physical there that you can grab a hold of, and it requires faith. And Robert says a lot of people can't get beyond that first step. I think it keeps a lot of people from uh, accepting the gospel uh, because they can't accept that we are saved by faith. Are we saved by faith alone? Are we saved by works alone? Are we saved by grace alone? No. It took God's grace to even offer, this, offer His Son but, you know, God's done his part. You know what it is. You and I have to do our part. A lot of people just can't go along with that. They think there's nothing you and I can do. That God is just spilling it out to us. William. The, the thought that you have faith makes it all work. you got to have that, no doubt. But once you get it, once you have faith, there's no guarantee you can keep it. You can talk yourself into and out of anything. We're, we're subjected to Yes. All day, every day. Yes. From me to you, whether it's television, whether it's somebody you work with, there's everything pulling you away from that. That, that that's something that, that that requires constant. I mean, I, I think that we can. I think we just have to to work on that and to, mm -hmm. you know, because like you said, it comes easier for some than others. Yep. I, Yeah, Williams is saying that you can have faith, like he says he does, but he says you can lose that faith. There are influences. I think, you know, of course, Satan's behind everything. But there are people in our lives that we maybe look up to that are maybe very, very intelligent or very, very successful. They have nothing to do with spiritual things, and they seem like they're blessed, and so we can fall out of it. Now, one of the tenets of, of Calvinism is once you are saved and you're in God's grasp, there's nothing going to cause you to lose it. But that's not true. The scripture teaches otherwise. That even Paul said after he preached to others, he could be rejected. We're talking about Paul, the Apostle Paul. He's saying he could be lost. He could be cast away. And you and I had to continue, as you said, to work on this thing. Well, how we do that? Through studying the scripture through fellowshipping with fellow Christians, 
where not isolating yourself and separating yourself from other Christians. I mean, we need that encouragement. Not because it's a bunch of built on some myth, but it's built on this. And we'll see here, uh, if I don't better hurry up, I won't get to it, is some of these prophecies in Isaiah confirm that what God says is real because he's talking about stuff that's not going to happen for hundreds of years. I mean, Christ is not going to come on the scene for another six or seven hundred years. He's going to talk about Cyrus, the Persian, who God will use to allow the people in Babylonian captivity after those 70 years to come back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls and to start that process of moving back to Jerusalem. It was only a remnant. A lot of Jews did not come back. They all didn't come back. But he used Persian, a, per, a Persian person who believed in idolatry, but also said he believed in God. And God used that person to allow his people to come back. Now, he could have not done that and left his people in, in Persian captivity and in Greek and in Roman going forward. But it just it shows you that once God has a plan, he's not going to go back on it. Like I said, he didn't give up on his Jewish people. He had every reason. I mean, you know, they just made him sick to see stuff they were involved with. Idolatry, all the stuff they were doing. Here, these are supposed to be my people. Look how they're living. Look how they're acting. But he stayed with them. And he says that. He says, I will, I'm not going to leave you. He's going to stay with them so that his purpose will be fulfilled. And here you and I are today. Uh, and, and Christ has paid that sacrifice. And you and I can be in Christ and have that hope of, of life eternal because God has not given up on us. And you know, he's not going to give up on any of us. We may give up on him, like William says. We can fall away. And believe me, if all the people were here that once professed Christ as part of the congregation, you couldn't get him in this room right now. There would be not enough seating. If everyone who's fallen away over the last 25 or 30 years would come back, and their kids and their family, you couldn't even get them in here which would be a great problem, wouldn't it? But as time goes on, uh, the world pulls on us. So it's kind of interesting, the example he uses here of, of these blacksmiths and, and making these uh, idols, uh, these images, uh, and building them up. Okay, uh, one last thing here. Let's go to the next chapter 45 and read those top seven verses. Actually... Let's go back to uh, 44, verse 26. It's not in your lesson, then continue through to 45. Uh, verse 26 of chapter 44. Who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers? Who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited? To the cities of Judah, you shall be built. And I will raise up her waste. He's talking about Jerusalem was destroyed. It went into captivity. Who says to the deep, be dry? And I will dry up your rivers. Now here's the biggie right here. This is very prophetic. Verse 28. Who says of Cyrus, and this guy was not even a gleam in his papa's eye. I mean, this is a hundred years before he even comes on. Who says Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasures, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built. It's referring to the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Way before it even happened. And to the temple your foundation shall be laid. Now, chapter 45, verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held. This, he's not a Jew. Yeah. Uh, he is, a, he is a, a Persian. To subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open, open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight, I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and the, cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden secrets of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who called you by your name, am the God of Israel. So he's talking tell, tell, tell about an individual. He actually names this individual, Cyrus. And guess what? A hundred years later, uh, we had the Assyrian, Assyrian, uh, 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 Assyrians that took over the northern kingdom. Uh, we have the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar. You can read about it in Daniel. And now we have this great Persian empire, which became the greatest empire of that time, to eventually fall to Alexander the Great, uh, the Greek. And then the Greeks would finally 
be taken into the Roman Empire. So you say, you read about all this in Daniel. I know this is repetitive, uh, but uh, you'll read all this in Daniel. So people, had him heard of this Cyrus, he went him on the scene. I mean, he was not even heard of, but yet it's going to come true 100 years from now. Now, if they don't build up your faith, folks, you know, why do we study history? There's a good reason right there. That should help our faith. That an individual is name by name. He's not even a Jew. He's a Persian that will help the people in captivity go back to Jerusalem, rebuild the walls of the temple and the city. Uh, I hope these things will help our faith, you know, build up our faith. But you know what? If we don't continue in them and continue to study and worship, we can fall away. Uh, and uh, a lot of people, unfortunately, uh, fall into that trap, once saved, always saved. And the scripture just don't teach that. I wish it did. I'd like to believe that. I'd like to believe that. But it's just not the case, is it? Thank you very, very much. I hope uh, this hadn't been a big confusing mess, but uh, appreciate your comments. Right. Yes. We to reach out and grab it, don't we? Thank you, Bob. Any, any other comments? Thank you very much, folks, for your participation.
Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to our services this morning. It's good to see everyone that's come out today to be a part of our assembly. If you're visiting, we would like for you to know that you're an honored guest always here. Uh, We know that you have a lot of choices, and we are extremely glad that you have chosen to come and and be with us and, and be here to worship. And to our People on live stream, we're extremely glad that you have tuned in and uh, also willing to be a part of our worship service today, and we invite you to come and, and be in the audience with us at any time, opportunities and any times that you have. Our sick list this morning, uh, we've, we've got some good news and some bad news as usual. Our Vicki Newberry, she's awaiting results from her biopsy, and we pray for good results there. Ashlyn Cooper, the five-year-old child whose family attends Signal Mountain, uh, had pneumonia, and now she's home and doing much better. Dorothy Graves, his face mother-in-law, had a trip to the ER with chest pains last past week, and she's now home and doing better. So we, we're always thankful for answered prayers. A uh, couple of of other updates, uh, a cousin to the Holland family, Hope Danko's son, Luke, is in the hospital. Uh, this is a seven-month-old son that's uh, it's in pretty bad condition. He's had to have a feeding tube and some things put in, so, so we're saddened to announce that. Also, some uh, updates from our sister, Billy Harris, on Tina Reynolds. She's home from the hospital. Thanks to everyone for prayers, and please continue to pray for her. Jennifer Heiss will be going for more testing next week. Please continue to pray for her and her family. Rory Heiss has COVID. She is the daughter of Jennifer. She also needs our prayers, and we're hopeful that she don't pass the COVID around because that's probably the last thing that this family is going to need. Also, some others on our prayer list. As usual, I ask that everybody continue to remember these folks in our daily prayers, but, but uh, some that jump out is our brother Robert Smith. He's back today. Uh, he's recovering from his shoulder surgery. Our, also, our sister Debbie and her husband Steve Fugit. Keep them in nine. Sister Nina Templeton's back with us today. We're thankful for that. Uh, Marvin and Ann Shipley. Uh, who's here today also. And uh, another one that I often think about is Bill and Sylvia Greer, who's at home and I'm sure they're online, but uh, we need need to keep all these folks in our prayers. Our sympathy goes out to the family of Lane Clements Hall, member of the Middle Valley Church who passed away this past week. Our Saudi Vacation Bible School is July the 31st, so if you hadn't marked your calendar, please do that and start making preparations for that. This will be a one-day event after our morning service. Well, then the rest of the evening will be uh, dedicated to our one-day vacation Bible school. We'll be going over the lives of Elijah and Elsha. Uh, We do have a new youth truth, truth, excuse me, there is a new youth truth on the youth bulletin board in the hallway if you'd like to pick up one of those area events the speaker at the last north hamilton church tuesday evening series will be kyle butt and that'll be this coming tuesday at seven another thing i'd like to mention is uh, for the ladies midge harrison wants to make bed covers for the homeless that the city is putting into homes She needs several ladies to help with this. She plans to use the tables in the fellowship room. So if you're interested, please call or text, get a hold of Midge some way and and let her know that you would like to be a part of that. Leading our service today, uh, our brother Brian Sorello will be leading our singing. 
Opening prayer will be by Brother Joe Varner. Uh, Lord's Supper will be by Brother Carl Harrison. And our closing prayer will be by Brother Ricky Ritchie, if he would. I'd like to remind everyone that between the services, our afternoon service starts at 1.30 p.m. And between services, uh, we always have a fellowship meal, and everybody's invited to attend and be part of that. If you aren't able to bring anything or if you're visiting, we always have plenty of food, and, and we would like for you to stay for that also and, and be a part of that. That's turned out to, to be a pretty popular event. I think most everybody's like me. Good food attracts me. And there's always good food there. Let's uh, get started this morning with, with going to our Lord in prayer. <clears throat> our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your good and holy name. Father, this morning we are thankful for everyone who's made it a priority today to come and assemble and, and be a part of our worship service. Father, we do understand and realize that it is a privilege that we have to worship you the only true and living God, and to study your divine word and fellowship with like Christian faith. Father, our hearts this morning are humble, our heads are bowed, and Father, we are grateful for all the blessings that we have received during this past week. Father, we are especially thankful for all the spiritual blessings that we receive from the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we're thankful for Brother Joel and his ability to preach and teach, and we're thankful for all of our Bible teachers that we have in this congregation and for everyone here who dedicate their lives to, to you. Father, we ask that you continue to bless each of us daily as you have in the past. Father, we pray that we can turn off all of our worldly thoughts and totally focus on our worship this day. Father, it is our prayer and our goal to stay active and committed to our heavenly goals. Father, this is our prayer through Jesus the Christ. Amen. If there's something that I may have missed, if you will give that to me, we'll get it announced in the afternoon. I'm not quite as pretty as uh, Brian Sorello. Brian's got a bad cough and asked me to... Uh, fill in for him this morning. If you don't like the song selections, see him. These are his the songs that he selected. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. We want you to join in our song service, 842. 842, A Common Love. We'll sing this through twice. A common love for each other Give to the Savior a common bond, holding us to the Six hundred twenty-two, number six two two. Tell me the story of Jesus. We'll sing this song. Prepare our hearts and minds for the Lord's Supper. Tell me the story of Jesus. Right on my heart, every word. 
Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God. Tidings on earth. Tell me the story of Jesus. Right on my heart, every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweet as that ever was heard. Hell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him. Tell how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender. Clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper. Love paid the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus. Right on my heart. Word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Does everyone have the bread in front of the back? It is said that there was a custom at the time of Jesus when the servant would set the plate for his master's meal. That setting would include a neatly folded napkin. The custom was if the master left the table and the napkin was used and cast aside, then the servant could clear the table. But if the napkin was still neatly folded, the master was not finished. He was coming back. I'm reading from John chapter 20. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene, early when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth with the other disciple and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying yet he did when he did not go in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, and came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again, from the dead. The master came back. He came back to prove the resurrection. 
and to establish so that his kingdom could be established. It could not have been established without that resurrection. The gates of hell did not prevail. Hallelujah. That's right. Heavenly Father, we're eternally thankful for your grace and mercy that you looked down upon us and loved us so much that you would give your Son in our stead. We eat this bread in, in remembrance of his body. And Father, we're thankful for this fruit of the vine. We ask your blessing upon it as we partake. We know that this is the memory of the blood that was shed to sanctify us, to set us apart. And Father, we're so thankful that Jesus came and established the church, and we're also thankful that he's coming again to receive us all. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, it's a convenient time to give thanks for the offering. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the privilege of worshiping you today, thankful for the privilege of returning a portion of our funds because we care for the church and we care for others. We thank you for all the blessings you bestowed upon us because you bless us more than we can say. Forgive us of our sins, Father, that we may be just and may be worthy to call you our Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Unto thee, O Lord. 